Hello there. Welcome back to In the Shadows of Utopia, the Khmer Rouge, and the Cambodian Nightmare. For this episode, I figured we might sidestep the kind of esoteric prologue or hypothetical situation that we sometimes try to jump in with to set the scene, and instead begin this episode with a good old-fashioned recap. We have covered multiple centuries, different continents, and introduced different political ideologies into this story so far. And as we approached the second half of the 20th century, all of these forces are going to start intermingling in very interesting and often tragic ways. The hurricane of history, as I've been at pains to turn into a meaningful metaphor, is rapidly approaching. Very rapidly, in fact, so rapid that we will make leaps and bounds toward the focus of this series, the Khmer Rouge Revolution, within the five-year period that this episode will span. The French colony of Indochina, this possession of the French Empire since the last quarter of the 19th century, is going to begin eroding very, very quickly. This process of decolonization, the mixing of nationalist and communist energies, the Cold War, before we know it, we are going to be smack bang in the middle of all of these things. But this isn't just a story about the Cold War, or the proxy wars fought in Southeast Asia. It's a story that involves the history of the people of that land, that goes back centuries, not just the actions of the world's superpowers. So, rather than putting you, the listener, in some ornate throne room or at the side of a dying revolutionary, I think for this one, we should just quickly re-establish ourselves in Indochina, remember who is who, and strap ourselves in for the crazy five years that the Second World War looks like for Cambodia and its surrounds, a region that will not be visited upon by quite the same destruction and horror as some other parts of the globe, but will perhaps be given its historical ticket and told to wait in line, because this beautiful land will soon be engulfed in the century of death. This episode will see us introduced properly to one of the characters, someone that will remain extremely relevant, basically until the end of this series. Prince Norodom Sihanouk. I just wanted to quickly mention that some of the resources used to talk about this enigmatic figure, including Milton Osborne's Prince of Light, Prince of Darkness, and indeed one of Sihanouk's own books, My War with the CIA, these were purchases that were made less of a financial burden by the supporters of the show. So a big thank you to them. If you'd like to help the show, you can leave a review or rating wherever you might be listening. Or you could make a one-time donation with PayPal, or in an ongoing fashion, for as little as $2 a month through the show's Patreon page. All right. Brilliant. So with that little preamble out of the way, let's have a quick look back at Cambodia in the period leading up to the Second World War, just to find our feet before we move the story into what is a pretty wild few years. Okay, so, at the end of our introduction into communism, we left the story with Nguyen Ai Kwok, Nguyen the Patriot, who will soon be known as Ho Chi Minh, functionary of the Comintern, forming the organisation that will eventually become the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, or ICP. That was in 1930. More on that part of the equation in a moment. The last time we spoke about Cambodia properly, we were in the company of Son Nhok Tan, the French-educated Khmer who had, along with a couple of others, begun publishing the first Khmer-language newspaper, Nagaravata. That 
was in 1936. Both these parts to the story represent the forces of nationalism, patriotism, communism, and anti-imperialism that are going to become increasingly relevant going forward. By this point, Cambodia had been under the French protectorate for almost three quarters of a century. That is, in my estimation, ample time for two things to happen. First, 75 years is enough time for people, like a whole population of people, to kind of get used to something. Gets you very much into the realms of, yeah, well, that's just kind of how it is. That's how things work. You wake up, you eat breakfast, you do your job, the French control your country, you come home, you eat dinner, you go to sleep. Secondly, it is also enough time for certain parts of that population to begin thinking about ways out. Enough time for you to get sick of how it is. Enough time for organisations to grow whose aims are squared exactly on trying to change the status quo. Now, on that second point, in comparison to Vietnam, or perhaps to what we could be calling the three separate parts of French Indochina that comprise modern-day Vietnam, Cochin China, Annam, and Tonkin, well, Cambodia is relatively behind the pace on, you know, changing the status quo in what we could perhaps unfairly simplify into something of a theme that's been shared by these two neighbouring countries for the last 200 years at this point. If we look at the example in just the difference in education and literacy in these two neighbouring parts of French Indochina, you kind of get a window into this larger theme. So in Cambodia, in 1936, we had that first Khmer language newspaper, supported by royal patronage, read primarily by the small emerging elite that was developing in Cambodia, and it seemed vaguely conservative. One of these themes regularly put out was urging Cambodians to wake up and try and catch up to the Chinese and Vietnamese who had a stronger control on commercial activities throughout the country. What it was not saying or advocating for was getting rid of the French. Historian David Chandler suggesting that there were probably more than 5,000 people that were reading each edition of the paper in 1937. Okay, well let's compare that small instance with what's going on in Vietnam. So uh, historian Ben Kiernan, in his book, Vietnam, informs us of what was going on in that eastern part of Indochina. Quote, The 1920s saw the appearance of 60 Vietnamese daily and weekly newspapers, followed by no fewer than 428 newspapers and journals from 1932 to 1945. The rapid cultural transformation also fostered a new sense of national identity. Vietnam in the 1920s and 1930s became the stage for a multiplicity of modern political parties amid alternating colonial repression and liberalisation, economic depression, anti-colonial and revolutionary revolts, a Buddhist revival, Vietnamese Catholic self-assertion, and the emergence in Cochin China of new popular religious sects. End quote. What Kiernan highlights there is that even on this rather basic example of native language newspapers, the difference between the two is pretty big. Some of that naturally comes from just the difference in population. Vietnam has a much larger population. But he also points to a host of other cultural and societal changes occurring in Vietnam over this time. One could highlight the trial of an early Vietnamese nationalist, known as Phan Boi Chao who had founded a patriotic movement in 1903. In 1925, a member of his group betrayed him, and he was sentenced to a life of hard labour. However, he was successfully able to use the opportunity the very publicised trial afforded him 
to expose some of the growing dissatisfaction many were feeling toward French rule. His final statement read out in court, eloquently calling for reform, for the Vietnamese nation to awaken, to modernise, and become independent. He even asked for the French to fulfil the civilising mission that it had originally claimed Indochina to pursue. I'll quote one section here. My work is merely to use my tongue and my pen, and my goal is political reform. The movement I lead is simple and righteous. So that's in the middle of the 1920s in Vietnam, just one example of the kinds of political developments that had begun to take shape and grow. Over this same period, into the 1920s and 30s, Cambodia was a space where minimal change occurred. We did see how the capital city, Phnom Penh, did become part of the country that was highly metropolitan, a city keeping up with the technical advancements of the 20th century, a small educated elite forming alongside. But relatively speaking, we are still talking about a country whose population was overwhelmingly rural, uneducated, and ruled by a king, or a succession of kings really, whose attentions were more focused on opium and women, and whose power extended really just to the ends of the opulent royal palace that was built for them by the French. In Cambodia, the French had experienced almost no direct challenge to their rule. We have gone over the few isolated events and incidents that can be perhaps retrospectively assigned that kind of framing, but were in and of themselves not really part of an overall anti-colonial movement or signs of a concerted growth of Cambodian nationalism. In the last few episodes, we've mentioned this handful of examples. We saw widespread revolts in the 1880s as the French looked to initiate tighter controls that would have disrupted very old systems of patronage and power in the rural Cambodian districts. Then, in 1916, there was a kind of peaceful, organised protest to overtaxation that involved peasants marching into the capital to ask the king to reduce this burden. And in 1926, we saw a village erupt into violence with the murder of a French official named Félix Bardez, who was requisitioning taxes in a fairly unorthodox manner. By the 1930s, that's about it. The Khmer were taxed extensively for the privilege of being part of the French Empire, and it is worth remembering the perilous position the kingdom was trying to maintain between Siam and Vietnam leading up to the period of French protection. But the trade-off there is that I think it's a fairly easy claim to make that Cambodians were being largely neglected in the French Empire. Modernity, at least for the majority of the population, was kept at bay, hardly being transitioned into the modern world through widespread education or political systems being managed in a way that would facilitate that transition at a later date or perhaps at a date that was actually quite close. So, while in the 1930s, Cambodia barely has a political system, short of a king and the system of governance put upon them by the French officials who taxed them, so the people pay their taxes, they love their king, this was the kind of absolute monarch that, you know, the French don't mind describing him as such, but they had the caveat that This is the kind of absolute monarch or semi-divine being that also had to submit all his decisions to the representative of the French government for approval. You know, your standard semi-divine being who has to answer to the French colonial government. If we look back across at Vietnam, one event highlights the kind of difference we're seeing here. In 1930, a full six years before the Cambodians had access to a newspaper that they could read and was about their country and in their own language, well, in Vietnam we have an event known as the Yen Bai Mutiny. Okay, so the Vietnam Nationalist Party 
founded in 1927, had recruited more than 1,500 members, primarily in the north in Tonkin, mostly in and around the Red River Delta. This was comprised mostly of students, small traders, and low-ranking civil servants. 1,500's pretty big. Apparently there was a split in the party leadership, however, and this resulted in the French authorities arresting most of the party's senior members. In desperation, the remainder of the party, led by former chairman Yuan Tai Hock, tried his hand at winning over a sizable amount of Vietnamese troops that were enlisted in the French colonial army. They were stationed at the Yen Bai barracks, northwest of Hanoi. They had a pretty detailed plan. Basically, they were going to take over the barracks, then take the city, and then secure it with anti-aircraft guns and turn it into a kind of stronghold. However, arrests leading up to the day of the attack, as well as general disorganisation and a lack of enthusiasm in supporting this rebellion in the majority of those troops stationed at the barracks. Well, basically, as Kiernan says, the revolt went off half-cocked on February 10th, 1930. Almost all Vietnamese Nationalist Party leaders were arrested, the French prosecuted 1,000 suspects, 600 were sentenced to forced labour, and 80 to death. Many more were exiled. Nguyen Tai Hoc and 12 others went to the gallows, and the party never recovered. End quote. But this mutiny, in and of itself, can be seen amongst a larger period of revolt in Vietnam from April 1930 to November 1931, with hundreds of rural demonstrations. Peasants trying to seize land back and their rice from their landlords. More than 100 worker strikes, as well as peasant-led violence killing up to 130 people in some northern and central provinces. And it was not just the political energy associated with nationalism at play. Again, here's Kiernan, quote, Members of the new Vietnamese Communist Party quickly became involved, attempting to lead the movement, often succeeding, and the colonial government responded with brutal and overwhelming force. In one confrontation in September 1930, troops and aircraft killed nearly 200 peasant demonstrators. Hundreds more were killed before the French regained control, taking 9,000 prisoners. End quote. Kiernan goes on to suggest that this general revolt against French rule, as we saw in the events that took place in Yen Bai and elsewhere, were not instigated by the Vietnamese communist leadership, but that their presence at the sides of the peasant demonstrators placed the communists as the leading party of Vietnamese anti-colonialism, particularly after the nationalists had been decimated. The communists in Vietnam are going to carve out some really solid credentials with the Vietnamese people over this tough period. The struggle against the French in Vietnam was quite clearly in a far more advanced state than it was in Cambodia. I think we could probably go as far as to say that the struggle, you know, existed in Vietnam, and not particularly in Cambodia, especially the communist side of that movement. Recall when we spoke about how the Vietnamese Communist Party was forced to change its name by the Comintern at the end of 1930 to the wider regional Indo-Chinese Communist Party. Despite Ho Chi Minh, who for some reason in this instance, I imagine like the older teenage sibling who's been forced by his parents to bring his younger brother and sister to a party that he knows they are way too young to enjoy. You know, Ho, at this point, he's a fairly well-respected member of the communist movement. He's saying, why do I have to bring these guys? They don't even have any communists in their country yet. To which the parental Soviet reply is, inevitably, because I said so. That's why. This Soviet directive, through the common turn, was based on the idea that all the countries within Indochina had one similar struggle to unite for. Opposition to the French. 
and they didn't want there to be different communist parties for each country within Indochina. And even though Vietnam was really the only place with any real communist activity, the decision was made to call it the Indochinese Communist Party. We will return to the Vietnamese story and focus on events there in a kind of epilogue at the end of the episode, but I hope from that recap you've got a little bit of a sense for what's going on in the region again. French rule can be repressive and unfair, neglectful and racist, but it has also become fairly entrenched in the region. It also has paradoxically led to the education of many and general modernization of society in certain areas that will give rise to nationalist or anti-colonial sentiments. I mean, Ho Chi Minh himself was a member of the French Communist Party. In Cambodia, Son Yok Tan, well, he'd been educated in France as a lawyer and teacher. The way the French have interacted with society will bring about some unexpected changes, and the events that transpired during the Second World War are going to bring a lot of this rapidly forward. Lately, I've been imagining this period leading up to the Second World War as a game of musical chairs, with all different parts of society playing all over Indochina. You've got the French elite, Cambodian royalty, Vietnamese communists. Well, in this round of musical chairs, the French have no idea when the music is going to stop. In fact, they think the music is never going to stop. They don't even really know they're playing musical chairs. They are almost blissfully ignorant if we consider what is in store for them. Likewise, the nominal leaders of Cambodia a royal family picked and chose by the French powers that be, well, these royals are almost literally stoned and enjoying the atmosphere of the palace. But in Vietnam, you get the impression that the Communist Party, they are taking the game pretty seriously. Calculating their steps, they've got one eye on an empty chair, and the other on the guy who's got his finger on the stereo stop button. To quote David Chandler in A History of Cambodia. World War II, more precisely, the period between June 1940 and October 1945, must be seen as a watershed in the history of Indochina. This is particularly true of Vietnam, but French policies in Cambodia, springing from weakness and Cambodian responses to them, differed sharply from what had gone before. By the end of 1945, Cambodian independence, impracticable and almost inconceivable in 1939, had become primarily a matter of time. End quote. West of Kampot, in the Damre Mountains, sits a kind of, what I would say is a kind of beautiful resort. Maybe that's not the right phrase. Imagine a lovely, old-fashioned hotel, quite a large one, sitting almost alone on top of a mountain at the edge of a cliff. It was built by the French in the mid-1920s, and I say built by the French, obviously it was literally built using Cambodian labour, and sadly, estimates generally sit at around 1,000 Cambodian deaths occurring over the course of the resort's construction, and of the roads winding up the mountain to it. Many of those who have visited Kampot may have made the trip up the hill toward the what was until quite recently very abandoned, Bokor Hill Station. They would have marvelled at the old Catholic church that sits nearby, or the views you can enjoy of the Gulf of Thailand, if you manage to visit when it isn't completely clouded in mist. The resort was a favourite of Cambodian royalty, as well as French officials, who sought an escape 
from the fairly oppressive heat that pervades throughout the rest of the country. If you visit today, it might be one of the very few places on your holiday where you might need to bring a jacket. But at this luxury resort in April 1941, sitting beside King Monivong was Saloth Sar's older sister, Ro Ung, one of the favourite and long-term concubines of the 65-year-old who was on his deathbed. This was a king who had been recently described in fairly disparaging terms by a family member as failing to handle the affairs of the state, a king who had surrounded himself with the women of his household and his many offspring, who took no interest in the details of administration, who signed the papers brought to him for validation without bothering to read them as he lay in a hammock, mockingly described as nothing more than a parrot whom the French had trained to say yes. Now King Monivong, whose full regal title was His Majesty, Glorious Lord, Scholar Protector, His Highness, Lord of Land and Sea, Sisawat Monivong of the Kingdom of Kampuchea. He had retired to this luxury resort, this Bokor Hill Station, for months. He'd actually been refusing to meet with French officials, or even converse in that language, leading up to his death. And many of the sources that I consulted while researching this episode will often associate words like humiliation or embittered with the king's final months alive. Now, why was that the case? How could a semi-divine ruler, a supposed absolute monarch, die in humiliation? Well, a lot had changed in Cambodia, Indochina, Southeast Asia, and, well, the world by 1941. There are lots of different dates and times given for the official outset of the Second World War, and a few of these are relevant to us in this story. First of all, the invasion of Poland in September 1939 prompts the United Kingdom and France to declare war against Nazi Germany. However, in Asia, Imperial Japan has been kind of at war against China for the best part of a decade since the invasion of Manchuria. I realise I've done this before, but the scope of this podcast really isn't going to support much detail on the wider events of the Second World War here. There are shows that do, and quite specifically, so I will allow those more familiar with the Second World War to explain it, if necessary, that is. But the big issue here, what we do need to know, is that Cambodia and all of Indochina are going to be affected by both the growing presence of Imperial Japan in the region, as well as the defeat of France to Nazi Germany and the so-called Vichy government that took control of French affairs. So, Vichy government. June 1940. The French army had been crushed by the Germans, and they signed an armistice. It would have been inconvenient for Nazi Germany to literally take over all of France and the functions of that country, so the collaborationist Vichy government, because it ruled from the city of Vichy rather than Paris, was formed under Field Marshal Pétain. Now, as you can probably imagine, any government willing to be subservient to and collaborate with Nazi Germany was pretty conservative. Vichy France was marked by an authoritarian turn, and the idea that the previous French Republic had been decadent and individualistic. It needed to turn back to traditional French values. Suddenly, Joan of Arc, symbol of patriotism and Catholicism, was plastered about everywhere. We will return to the ideology of that government and how that plays a role in filtering into Cambodian politics and society in a moment. But the other big thing to mention is 
that naturally the French are in an extremely weakened position. Most of their army had been either defeated or neutralised, and obviously a big part of being defeated by Nazi Germany is that the capability of France to fight any war against the Nazis had to be dismantled. But Vichy France did maintain control of some colonies, including Indochina. But perhaps control is a strong word to use. Remember, supposedly, the whole reason Cambodia is part of French Indochina is because it was part of a protectorate. So the question some were naturally asking was, well, if France can no longer protect Cambodia, what is the point of a protectorate? Now, if we zoom out on the map a little bit here, it's pretty easy to see why the French would be concerned with their ability to keep Indochina as part of their empire. France is all the way over here, and Indochina all the way over here. And they only have the scraps of an army. And there is a new regional expansionist power in the picture. The spread of Japanese power across Asia, coupled with the imperial ambitions of that country, led the Japanese to view the defeat of France to Germany as a fairly clear sign of weakness. So much so that they began moving troops into the region in the early 1940s. I guess we could term that as flexing. You know, just going to put some troops here. You don't mind, do you? There was no way that Vichy France could maintain an actual military defence of their colony. But they acquiesced to this Japanese presence and were able to maintain their control of Indochina following the arrival of Japanese armed forces. And what makes this relationship extra awkward is that they were allies in the sense that both were on the Axis side of the war. The Japanese stationed 30,000 troops throughout French Indochina. And by the end of the war, that number would nearly double. And it felt uneasy. Like I said, these are big, big changes. Huge. And they happen very quickly. The French Third Republic, in existence for 70 years, and since that war with Prussia that we spoke about and the failed Paris Commune, all of that basically collapses overnight, and France becomes a kind of vassal state, I guess, with those who do remain in charge, trying to maintain well, this idea of France over the course of the Second World War, even if the Axis powers were to eventually win. They also wanted to maintain what was left of their empire after the war, so their tenuous grasp on Indochina had to be delicately treated. They knew they had to accept the Japanese presence there, but this also introduced problems of how to rule the native populations in a time when they no longer had the raw power to enforce this rule quite as directly. David Chandler, in the same text that we had quoted him earlier, writes... Vichy rule was in some ways more flexible in others, more repressive, and certainly more ideological than the governments provided by the Third Republic had ever been. This was partly because officials, to appease the Japanese and following ideological preferences of their own, tended to follow a pro-Axis, anti-British line, and partly because perceiving their vulnerability in Southeast Asia they sought to retain control while using very little of their depleted military forces. End quote. Chandler goes on to list some of the examples of the regime's flexibility, such as widening the responsibility of native officials, as well as raising their salaries, and encouraging an enhanced sense of national identity that was linked to the idealization of the Angkorian era, and of Jayavarman VII in particular. It's this ideological point I want to linger on for a moment, because a historian like Ben Kiernan suggests in his book Blood and Soil 
that the traditionalist national revolution that was going on in Vichy, France, this conservative new movement that was idealizing heroes from French history like Joan of Arc, you know, using that kind of symbol to foster a new ideology. Well, they're going to try and do the same thing in Cambodia. Try and create a sincere national spirit, in the words of the new French Governor General of Indochina, Admiral Jean de Coe. This glorification of the distant past would influence the product of Cambodian nationalism in the years to follow. He even encouraged kinds of youth groups to participate in archaeological digs at Angkor to physically excavate their cultural roots, in the hopes of spurring on this kind of feeling, encouraging the creation of that nationalistic political energy. Kiernan states that, quote, while Decaux's wartime policy strained to foster competing new loyalties to both France and its Indochina Federation, it also deliberately stimulated local racialist and cultural particularism, lending intellectual support even to possible expansionist Khmer visions of a greater Cambodia. End quote. So, we're creating a kind of Cambodian nationalism, but to serve French interests. Why? Well, part of it stems from the ideological program that Vichy was promoting in France itself. But doing the same thing in Indochina had the added goal of preventing a kind of pan-Asianism. As we've seen, Imperial Japan is spreading throughout the region, and this formidable power could also appeal to neighbouring colonised peoples. With the slogan, Asia for the Asians which is an interesting slogan to get behind if we recall that Japan was conquering, literally colonizing places, like in mainland China, Manchuria, Nanjing, as well as in Burma. But the slogan, or even the idea, is still pretty powerful for people living in areas that had been subject to European rule. And the kind of basic racist assumptions that go into that kind of power dynamic are challenged by the idea of an Asian nation like Japan liberating other Asian countries. Vichy France could try to sidestep that prospect, perhaps this slightly more authentic nationalism, by promoting their version. A kind of Cambodia for the Cambodians, but under French rule and part of French Indochina where specific Cambodian traditions or imagined notions of Cambodia are reinforced, cultivated, but to suit French interests. Okay, so that's a fair bit to sink in. Nazis invade France. New French government takes over. Japanese are a growing power in Asia, who sense French weakness and, for military purposes of their own, also need to start stationing their forces throughout Indochina, but are nominally allied to this new French Vichy regime as part of a wider alliance with the Axis powers. Vichy France has a different ideological take on things. After all, they are collaborating with the Nazis, and part of that involves changes to how they implement their now tenuous rule over places like Cambodia and Vietnam. Woof. So that's 1940. I remember the first time I went through a chapter on this part of Cambodian history, and it, well, like I said, it's a dense five years. You've got a lot of people coming in and out, but... That's the basic introduction to the following scenarios that we are now going to focus on. That's the map painting backdrop that our actors will be performing in front of. And all of the stuff that I've just mentioned there 
That is just the start of why King Monivong is lying on his deathbed at the mountainside resort at Bokor Hill Station in humiliation. That humiliation, according to historians such as David Chandler and Philip Short, would be due to the big chunks of Cambodian territory that had recently been lost to Thailand, following the Franco-Thai War that had broke out at the end of 1940. What was that? Sorry, France had a war with Thailand? Yes. And one that doesn't end that well for the weakened Vichy government. You might have noticed I've started saying Thailand as well, not Siam. And that's because a new Thai government, active from 1938 under Pibil Songram, had mandated that name change. The new prime minister, who was pro-Japanese, had seized this opportunity of French weakness to regain territories in Cambodia and Laos that the Thai had ceded earlier in the century to the French. The Thai invaded western Cambodian provinces, war broke out, and on land the poorly equipped French forces suffered a series of defeats. At sea, however, French aircraft and warships scored a major victory over the Thai fleet in January 1941. So, by this point, not only had the French had to acquiesce to Japanese requests to station troops throughout Indochina, but now had been engaged in a war with the Thai, which the Japanese stepped in to, you know, mediate a peace between you guys. Forcing the French to the negotiation table in Tokyo. More flexing. As a result, Batambang and most of Siem Reap but not the region of Angkor itself. Well, all of that was ceded back to the Thai for what Chandler says was the derisory sum of six million piastres. So the time-honoured tradition of Cambodian losses to its more powerful neighbours is once again played out, and this time under the French protectorate, looking increasingly less protective. And the Governor-General de Coe, he knows this. So when Monivong eventually dies at the Bokor Hill Station on April 23rd, 1941, French interests in Indochina are the key consideration when choosing the successor to the throne. And the easiest way to keep French interests front and centre? Well, why not pick a teenager? Someone that will just do as they are told, right? Historian Milton Osborne, claiming that, quote, A concern to have an easily controlled youth on the Cambodian throne, rather than have the even marginal risk of an older man who might stand in the way of the implementation of some French policies, was without doubt the main reason for the choice of Sihanou. End quote. So essentially, let's pick a kid so we can tell him what to do and try and hold on to our possession here a little bit longer. Well, the French might have backed the wrong horse on that bet. And in the words of David Chandler, the shy young man who came to the throne in April 1941 and was crowned in October, he seemed an unlikely candidate to go on and dominate Cambodian politics for over 60 years. End quote. The French chose Monivong's grandson, the 19-year-old prince, Norodom Sihanouk. Sihanouk is going to play a huge part in this story, indeed in the story of Cambodian history in the 20th century. I don't believe, perhaps since the introduction to this whole series, 
have we really spent much time discussing him? I believe the phrase I used back then was that he was a kind of enigmatic character. And as I felt pretty constrained for time back then, I thought that was a suitably vague term, kind of a placeholder thing, to use about someone who elicits a range of emotions in me in my time studying him. Hopefully you too will be able to understand what I mean as we go throughout the rest of the series. But we will see him in a variety of different lights. He will at times be a victim of circumstance, and at others be the cause of tragedy. There is a wide divergence in how critical you can be of this man, who will dominate Cambodian politics for so long. And that criticism can even extend to the many motion pictures that he embarked on making in the late 60s, right up until the time he was ousted from power, and I think since then too. The sources I have available to consult vary from books written about him, books written by him, his diaries, interviews for TV, an hour-long speech he made to the Australian National Press, his movies, and even an exclusive interview with Playboy magazine. I find him eloquent, charming, funny, and fascinating, but also frustrating, slippery, and duplicitous. Again, I hope to be able to showcase some of this, but as we are introducing him here, essentially for the first time, we should start with his childhood, before he was crowned king as a teenager. Milton Osborne's biography of Seanock is great, and I think I'll end up quoting it at length when we deal with the prince, because I find myself unable to paraphrase it much better. So here is Osborne on the early years of the prince. Quote, Sihanouk has given us a relatively frank account of his childhood, one that is rather less marked by the special pleading frequently found in the autobiographical writings dealing with his later years. He had a lonely upbringing as the only child of increasingly estranged parents. His father emerges from Sihanouk's own description of his early years as an amiably dedicated womanizer, kindly enough to his son in a distant fashion, but hardly concerned with his day-to-day -day development. In his behaviour, Suramarit, his father, was probably little different from most Cambodian princes of his generation. Kosamak, Sihanouk's mother, was more interested in her son and became a major influence in his adult life. But in his early years, and in response to the advice of an astrologer, she consigned his upbringing to an aged relative. In turn, the relative entrusted Sihanouk's care to an old female servant. Anano, Sihanouk calls her in his description of his childhood. A trusted domestic, he suggests like one of the female house slaves depicted in Gone with the Wind. He lived in a world in which the word and comforting presence of women was a dominant feature. End quote. Osborne giving us some, you know, rich kid syndrome issues there. Moving forward, he commences his formal education at a primary school in Phnom Penh, where naturally the language of instruction was French. Estimates of his academic abilities vary, but he showed a real talent for music at a young age, and a passion for cinema. In the 1930s, Osborne suggests that perhaps this interest in the movies, and the amount of time he was spending watching them, led his parents to enrol him in the school with the best reputation in Indochina, the Lycée Chasseloup Labat in Saigon. Occasionally, he would still come back to Phnom Penh and do the royal thing, continuing his love of music, acting in Cambodian-language versions of classic French plays with other princes and princesses. Remember, there are a lot of them. He would have time to observe his grandfather, Monivong, during his time in power as well. And it was actually Sihanouk, whose words I relayed earlier, about the king. A description of a man more content with his concubines and hanging out in a hammock than with the administration of a country. 
happy enough to sign the papers the French brought him, the trained parrot, as Sihanouk put it. Well, little did the young prince know that it wouldn't be long before he was the one having to sign the papers. Leading up into the 1940s and Monavong's eventual death, there was a lot of chatter about who might eventually be made the next king. And the young prince was not in the picture. His uncle, Monireth, or his father, seemed like more likely candidates. And this kind of ties into the dynastic squabbling that I've not got too much time for, because A, I tend not to be able to keep a great track of it, as I said, big families, lots of disputes, and B, I would struggle to explain it to an audience. I also don't think it really influences the story we're going to be focusing on that much, but in a nutshell, there are two big branches of the Cambodian royal family, the Sisawats and the Norodoms. Sihanouk's father, Suramariat, was of the Norodom branch, and he had married Princess Kosamak, who was part of the Sisawats. Kind of a Romeo and Juliet thing. We could get into detail there, but as I've mentioned a few times before in this series, lots of squabbling. I think they didn't have much else to do to pass the time. Probably make a great reality TV show. The real princes and princesses of the Cambodian royal family, that kind of thing. But anyway, Sihanouk, as a son of both the Norodom and Sisawat branches of the big royal family, well, he kind of represents a reduction in the rivalry between the two parts of the royal family. Like, imagine if Romeo and Juliet had had a happy ending and had a kid. Maybe the Capulets and the Montagues would have gotten together a bit more. Anyway, some scholars say that that might have played a role in the reason that Sihanouk was chosen. Like, the French were paying attention to the royal families. They were really into this stuff as well. But I tend to agree with the historians who think it was probably a pretty small part of the calculations that French officials were doing there in choosing who to succeed his grandfather. I'm more comfortable just saying it was based on choosing someone that the French thought would be a pliable ruler in what was a confusing time across French Indochina. According to Osborne, Sihanouk said that upon receiving the news that he was going to be king, he said, My first reaction was fear, of fright. I broke down in tears. Five months later, at his official coronation, the apprehension of becoming king might just be visible in the young man's eyes captured in the official photograph of him in full royal regalia as he stares into the camera. Apparently, there was quite an ill omen that marked his coronation as well. A large precious candle that was lit by court Brahmins as part of the ritual was blown out in the wind just two days later. I'm not well versed in my court superstition, so I can't give you the exact meaning of that. But supposedly it was bad enough that, you know, people in the know were concerned for the young king's reign. Osborne notes quite dryly that the small political elite in Cambodia in the early 1940s would have been well aware of the bad omens that were pervading throughout the region without having to resort to superstition. There was enough going on to worry about without knowing that the king's coronation candle had blown out prematurely. Sihanouk's early reign was probably similar in character to what many others would do when thrust into that kind of situation. Can you imagine being made king at 19? But knowing, in a way, that you were more or less just filling a role. He wasn't dumb. It seems to me he knew the deal. Like, yes, there is something very special about actually becoming the king. It carries a lot of cultural weight, particularly being brought up within a large royal family. But we saw from his own words about Monivong that there was an acknowledgement 
that the French were in control, and that there was a kind of figurehead operation going on, being king, in these days, and I guess what had been apparent for decades at this point. So, Sihanouk enjoys himself. Horse riding, the cinema, the theatre, water skiing, basketball, watching football matches, and as many 19-year-old boys would do, he goes out and enjoys the company of women. His amorous adventures, as he put it to a biographer in the early 1970s. He goes out and he plays the role the French had planned for him. Now, before we change direction here slightly and explain some developments that occur outside of the royal palace, this might be a good opportunity just to lay down a bit of groundwork for what is going to follow. Now, some of the reasons why Sihanouk's popularity and power will extend so far over basically the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st, well, they might start developing very early on and stem from exactly what the French were trying to do in the early 1940s, and why they chose Sihanouk to ascend the throne. Remember, the French are worried. They don't have a lot of hard power to control a region that is very far away from home. They literally have a more powerful foreign force, one that is probably more appealing to this native population, just hanging around. Japanese troops are visible, and their political actions noticeable. So the French see the Cambodian royalty as one method that they can maintain control with. They further reinforce the symbolic importance of the monarchy. And at this is at a time when they were also hearkening back to traditional nationalistic rhetoric about Angkor and Jayavarman VII, They make the king as visible and popular as possible for the Cambodian people. Sihanouk has way more contact with the population than any other king. The French were trying to bolster their position in Cambodia through their association with the young king. The more powerful he is, the more his people are willing to go along with his rule, the better it is for the French officials because they're actually pulling the strings, and they're desperately trying to maintain their empire. In subsequent episodes, we will see the power that Sihanouk has over his people, and some of the consequences of being able to have that kind of influence. But for now, he's basically just a playboy. A few moments ago, I said that we were going to divert our attention to events that were occurring outside of the royal palace. But in reality, these events really aren't that far away from literally where the royal palace is in Phnom Penh, because the boys over at the Nagaravata, the only Cambodian newspaper in town, that's Somnok Tan, Pak Choan, and Sim Va, well, they are going to start cooking up some changes and Cambodian nationalism was about to make a considerable breakthrough in these tumultuous times. Alrighty then, the Nagaravada group. That's the phrase we will use to describe the men who had arisen in this newly forming Cambodian intellectual class, and who had ties with the Buddhist clergy. They are also usually described as Cambodia's first nationalists, the symbol of which is that first Khmer language newspaper, Nagaravata. Pali for Angkor Wat. We mentioned them before, but I would like to hone in on who we could probably talk about as the head of this group, or at least the member that will feature most prominently in this story, Son Yok Tan. 
During this whole World War II shakeup, the Nagaravata group, and Tan in particular, are going to play big parts. I mean, naturally, we've been talking about them from the mid 1930s, but once this shakeup starts happening, when France is defeated by Germany in 1940, well, the first thing Tan does is approach the then French Résident Supérieur, Thibodeau, basically the governor of Cambodia, and while he professes some sympathy for France in this situation, he also asks for the restitution of Cambodia to the Cambodians, on the grounds that France was no longer able to protect the country. That's a bold move. As I mentioned at the outset, in this game of political musical chairs, many of the people playing didn't really know they were playing. They didn't know the music could stop. And now you've got a group like the editors of a newspaper, Nagaravata, essentially putting their hands up and saying, well, hey, if the music stops, maybe we can have a go at this. Their newspaper, up until then, had been, as we've said, largely conservative, not anti-French. More about Cambodians, you know, waking up, bemoaning the state of the country, trying to get more Khmer to involve themselves in the nation. But for Son Nok Tan and the Nagaravata group, some things will begin happening that transforms their position from, you know, editors of a newspaper and part of this intellectual elite into the leaders of a Cambodian nationalist movement. Firstly, the arrival of the Japanese is a game changer. In the words of David Chandler, quote, French military weakness and Japanese sympathy for certain anti-colonial movements, evident throughout Southeast Asia by 1942, had not passed unnoticed among the intellectuals who were associated with the Buddhist Institute and Nagaravata. Between 1940 and 1942, the paper took on an increasingly pro-Japanese, anti-colonial line. End quote. So not only are there certain groups who now feel emboldened to criticise French rule, they are also looking at the Japanese as a kind of potential lever, a facilitator, out from French control. It's important to remember at this time that the Japanese presence in places like Cambodia had become very visible. For instance, there was even a Japanese police headquarters in Phnom Penh. And it's Son Nyok Tan that will become increasingly closer to the Japanese authorities in this period. Uh, according to Sinyanok in stuff he would write a few years later, Son Nyok Tan is getting around in a Japanese military uniform from a pretty early time. You know, he's actively seeking their support. Okay, so Japan. Big influence on what's going to happen next. Somewhat more complicated in all of this is the role that the Thai are now going to play. This war with the French, that had created some interesting conditions over on that northwestern border. If you'll recall, some of our previous episodes touching on history prior to the 20th century, these provinces in Cambodia's northwest have come under Thai control at various points, the most recent being after the French protectorate itself was established. You recall that the French kind of used these parts of Cambodia as a bargaining chip in wrestling the rest of Cambodia away from Thai suzerainty in the 1860s. Then, in 1906, negotiations occurred that led to the retrocession of the provinces back into Cambodia. I'm a little bit reluctant to get into too much detail here and now. I'm going to start listing off names, because I think it might take us a little too far off track. But this relationship with the Thai, these provinces, and the Khmer that lived there, 
will provide our story with a fertile ground for anti-colonial or anti-government resistance over the next few years and decades. It's at this point where we can tentatively introduce the term Khmer Isarak into our story, which is kind of like the Khmer Freedom Fighters. It's a hard definition to pin down, you'll we'll get there. But this was originally set up as a kind of independent Cambodia committee in Bangkok in the early 1940s by a former director of a Batambang pawn shop. The term Isarak is a little bit hard to define because under the banner of Khmer independence, eventually different activists and groups will be loosely allied together and catalogued. But you'll have nationalists, local warlords, communists. This will become more of a focus over the next few episodes. But for now, it's important to bring them up because there are some contending anti-colonial movements seemingly springing up out of nowhere. For Son Noctan and the Nagaravata group, the fact that the Thai had taken parts of Cambodia and now there was this Khmer independence group starting to spring up in those areas. Well, according to Ben Kiernan, these developments, quote, worried them. Song Nyok Tan and Pak Chuan decided to create a political organization capable, at the right time, of claiming independence for Cambodia from the Japanese and, with support, resist new Thai advances on Cambodian territory. End quote. This leads them to start actively sounding out students and merchants and begin recruiting followers, developing a kind of nationalist group that might be capable of trying to take control from the French if an opportunity arose. Cambodia has its first proper nationalist movement. We've seen the ideas transform into an actual group of people willing to make change rather than this nationalist energy just being in the ether. And why not just quickly define that once again? I realise in previous episodes I've been talking about the emotional aspect of nationalism, as this kind of energy that can be harnessed or created to motivate groups or individuals toward political goals. But perhaps those goals need to be touched on again. And I'm going to use a definition Edwin Moyes used in a journal article in about 1988. So we could think of a nationalist as a person who believes that his or her land should be a nation state. Meaning that something that seems like a natural unit in terms of language, culture, tradition, this should not be only independent but united under an effective central government, and that the population should have the status of citizens of that nation, that there should be a sense of mutual responsibility between the government and its people. We could probably also quickly introduce patriotism into that mix. So patriotism, according to Moyes, is a kind of emotional allegiance to one's homeland and a determination to prevent it from being dominated by outsiders. Moyes makes the good point that while patriotism is often expressed as nationalism, they aren't the same thing, which can be helpful when trying to ask a question like, can a committed communist also be a nationalist? Or how communist movements can harness nationalistic energy, or indeed the kinds of nationalistic things that communist governments tend to do when they actually attain power. But again, let's not get too far off track here. Tan and the Nagaravat group, they are trying to build this 
nationalist movement in French colonial Cambodia. They are recruiting among the people and using the kinds of tools that we mentioned nationalism often hinges on. Things like their newspaper, which is being censored by French authorities by this point. Tan is attempting to introduce this nationalist political energy to a large group to be able to take Cambodia back for the Cambodians. And they see Japan, and even to an extent Thailand, as possible allies in trying to achieve this goal. Which is weird and fraught with complexities if you stop and think about it for a second. First of all, they're going after Japan. Japan is like the big goal here. And Japan is an ally of Vichy France. And on that western border, the Thai government, they're also pro-Japanese. In the words of Ben Kiernan, quote, Anti-French mobilization was still in its infancy in Cambodia and was divided into contending groups under the influence of Thai and or Japanese governments. These governments were allied to one another and unlikely to favour the interests of the Khmer at the expense of an ally. The Khmers themselves were feeling their way in a totally changed situation. End quote. It also feels just like another slight echo of history, where a Khmer political movement, primarily concerned with gaining independence from one or another more powerful group, is forced to ally itself with another powerful external ally in order to achieve this whether it's looking toward the Vietnamese in the 1880s as a way out of Thai control, or then the Thai to do the same but to oust the Vietnamese, or then to the French as a way out from both regional neighbours. And now to the Japanese as a way out from the French. But that's all the big history stuff. That's this growing historical hurricane thing that I keep harping on about. For now, let's follow the course of events in the early 1940s. Because an opportunity is going to arise for the Nagaravata group to be able to put some pressure on the French and their new young king. The French colonial authorities in Cambodia hadn't been able to maintain the best relationship with the Buddhist monastic order since setting up this protectorate in the 19th century. In the eyes of the French, the Buddhist Sangha offered Cambodians an alternative value system to the one that was brought to them by the French Empire. So when the French introduced the Gregorian calendar into Cambodia in early 1942, as well as planning for a new Romanized version of the Khmer script to be implemented, this was a cause for concern for many monks. Kind of understandable too. Imagine if someone waltzed in and said your language was garbage which is probably a light way of putting it, one French official in fairly classic kinds of racialist thinking, presumed that the language itself was leading to Cambodians not being able to think properly, and thus indicative of their less-than-advanced state. So that's the French perspective. But for the Sangha itself, this was seen as an attack on traditional learning, and the high status of traditional educators. Generally, the monks were tasked with this in pre-colonial Cambodia. That is, you know, for hundreds of years up until this point. One of these monks, with fairly high standing in that community, known as Hem Chiu, would soon be implicated in a vague anti-French plot 
In Philip Short's biography of Pol Pot, he states that on July 18th, 1942, the French authorities arrested two monks suspected of subversive activities, something he notes as providing the embryonic nationalist movement with its first martyrs. Now, both Chandler and Kiernan offer different insights into this arrest, and just what was being planned by these monks, as well as their association with the nationalist movement. Chandler says in A History of Cambodia, quote, Hem Chiu, a teacher at the Advanced Pali School in Phnom Penh, was implicated in an anti-French plot when he proposed to several members of the Cambodian militia vague plans for a coup. A pro-French militiaman, apparently, informed on him, and he was arrested on July 17th. End quote. Kiernan, in How Pol Pot Came to Power, well, he puts it slightly differently. Firstly, he states that Song Yok Tan had already decided to attempt a pro-Japanese coup, well before the monks are getting arrested. That he had already been in contact with a uh, Lieutenant Ochi, who was the commander of the Japanese police in Phnom Penh, and that there was encouragement from the Japanese to carry something out. Which lends more gravity to what the monks were actually caught doing, as if there was something more concrete that they were planning, something along the lines of that mutiny at Yen Bai that we talked about in Vietnam in the 1930. On the subject of Hem Chio's arrest, Kiernan says that this occurred because he and another monk, Nguyen Dong, were preaching anti-French sermons to Khmer troops in the colonial army in preparation for the revolt. And that's how he puts it. Elsewhere, it's made apparent that the monks were handing out anti-French pamphlets as well, which sounds more like the monks were aware of a conspiracy to stage a coup and were attempting to you know, drum up support within the armed forces. He also states that the monks were main activists in the group that Song Nyok Tan and the others had recruited into that new nationalist cause. I've brought up the slight changes in emphasis between the historians here, firstly because I'm just happy that the series is finally at the point I've got four or five sources to be able to consult on one event, which is one of the best parts of doing history. The other reason is because depending on which version we kind of go along with here, well, it makes it at least seem that the Cambodian nationalists were getting confident. They were spreading their message. They were in consultation with the Japanese. They may have been arranging or planning some kind of route to power, or perhaps they just thought they were doing that. Perhaps it was less premeditated, and this monks, these monks, anti-French sermons had not been a particular stage in an insurrection, but a mere byproduct of their exposure to the nationalist cause. Maybe these were just patriots. Either way, these nationalist martyrs, as Short put it, well, they're going to go down in history. As Philip Short says, Hem Chiu and a fellow monk, Nguyen Dong, are arrested following this anti-French subversion. But it's how they are arrested that really kicks up a fuss. Chiu was summarily defrocked by the French authorities without the proper monastic laws having been consulted. A monk could not be deprived of this high status 
without being judged by his fellow monks. In other words, the Buddhist hierarchy was in charge, and the French had committed quite a cross-cultural taboo. At a time when they had already been seemingly disrespecting this massive cultural authority. In the words of Chandler, quote, Hem Chiu was an important member of the Sangha, and the manner of his arrest by civil authorities who failed to allow him the ritual of leaving the monastic order affronted his religious colleagues while handing nationalists of the Nagaravata clique a cause for celebration. End quote. And I guess I should say that Chandler, in a kind of old-fashioned way that I love, he says, a cause célèbre, instead of the clunky English version that I used. I actually have this kind of fond, kind of embarrassing memory of the first time I met with David at university to discuss ideas for my thesis project. And I remember very early on him asking me, like, how's your French? Not, you know... Can you speak French, Lachlan? Or something along those lines, but in that great old-fashioned academic style. The assumption that, like, naturally you can read, write, and speak French, but I guess I should ask this guy how well he can do that. And I think everyone who's listened to this series so far will be able to tell just how bad I am at even pretending I can pronounce certain French words. So yeah, no French for me, Monsieur Chandler. But, uh, I digress. Back to the story. Essentially, arresting these two monks in this sacrilegious fashion gave Tan and his burgeoning nationalist movement a kind of focal point that they may be able to rally some fairly widespread support around. They weren't just going to write some editorial about this. It was time to take it to the streets, baby. Tan basically goes straight to the Japanese police headquarters, where apparently he's pretty familiar. And over the next couple of days, his group liaised with the Japanese about staging a kind of anti-French demonstration. A protest in support for these arrested monks. Which, if we go with Kiernan's account, there may have already been some vague blueprint in play here, even before this new catalyst for a protest. In Tan's letters from this period that we are still able to consult, we see that he contacted the Japanese authorities in Saigon, who had jurisdiction over their colleagues in Phnom Penh. And he said that Because our movement and our preparations for a coup d'etat against the French, with the promised support of the Japanese Imperial Army, had already almost reached their maturity, it was imperative that the French should not succeed in extinguishing them without a demonstration of their vitality. End quote. Now, I find that interesting to read, because it's hard to gauge exactly where these supposed plans were before Hem Chiyo's arrest. From what we just read, it seems like Tan is saying, we had a solid plan for a coup, and this monk was trying to drum up some support, but then someone told on him, so now the whole thing's off. But before the French put the kibosh on this plan, we should at least have a big demonstration or something to show them that we have a genuine movement going on. We've got something here. And that our friends, the Japanese, they're in it on our side. They're going to support us. It's just hard for me to say whether they've rushed into this or not. Do they have a plan? Or is this off the cuff? I tend to think that this was more just seizing an opportunity than it was anything else. Perhaps Tan in this letter is making it seem to his Japanese allies 
that Cambodian plans for a coup are more advanced than they are, in order for them to get behind this demonstration. Right here and now. It's hard to say. In the words of one French ethnologist that was living in Phnom Penh at this time, the arrest of the monks had been a monstrous gaffe, and it seemed that this small nationalist movement now had a moment that it might be able to thrive in. The Japanese do agree to this protest going ahead, but they mandate that it must be peaceful with the goal of marching on the resident superior's office and handing over a list of demands. The release of the detained monks, for starters, naturally. And just a few other things around there, let's see here. Okay, so we've got... The reorganisation in all fields of public life. Close economic collaboration with Japan to aid the war effort. Tax reduction. Oh, and a... New constitution, providing for a national socialist monarchy. Hmm, okay. This protest had now turned into a pretty big signal of intent for the nationalists. It had essentially become an overt demand for the French to step back from control. This is a big step for them. And are they ready? Well, it all starts on the morning of the 20th of July. Song Yok Tan, in a fairly pragmatic move, decides to wait this out in the Japanese police headquarters. This is a safe space for him. His partner at the Nagaravata, Pak Choen, will lead the protest. If you've visited Phnom Penh or if you live there, you might be familiar with the lovely areas in and around where the Independence Monument stands today up through to the area around the Royal Palace and that prime riverside area that leads toward Wat Phnom in the north of the city. Well, it's in that kind of direction that this protest will move. A growing mass of people, by all accounts somewhere between one or two thousand, and perhaps about half of that being made up of monks that pour out of monasteries such as Lanka and Unalum, on the way to the French Residence Superior. This was the biggest show of anti-French sentiment in almost 30 years. Thousands of onlookers would have seen this protest as it eventually reached its destination. Rumours went around that following the protest, a Japanese-supported coup d'etat would occur. Pak Chun, flanked by what would have been a very colourful group of demonstrators, addressed the French officials that were waiting outside, and asked to meet with the Résident Supérieur. His list of demands with him, he was shown in, and the door immediately closed behind him. The editor of Nagaravata was not exactly welcomed. In fact, He was swiftly arrested and taken out the back of the building and into a car. Waiting outside, the demonstrators grew restless. Even after a leading monk and King Sihanouk's father, Suramarit, tried to appease them by saying that the issues they were bringing up were going to be looked into. Some of the crowd left after this, but some began trying to break into the building. A riot ensued. Several hundred police who were present, armed with batons, went in on the crowd, who themselves were carrying sticks, stones, and kind of makeshift slings? In fact, the monks that were present had their saffron-coloured umbrellas with them too, and they used them to strike out at the police. Hence the name... Umbrella Revolt, that this event will be referred to in a somewhat derogatory fashion by some parties in the future. By all accounts, there were many injuries, but no deaths. Two truckloads of Japanese soldiers arrived during the riot, 
but they didn't intervene. A fairly big indication of perhaps how much the Nagaravata group may have overestimated the support that they thought their Asian brethren were going to provide them. There would be more than 200 arrests, a number which included some important members of this embryonic nationalist movement, including Pak Chun. Others who had escaped arrest, various members who had been recruited, including those in the Sangha or elsewhere, decided they should flee, many of whom would end up becoming big figures in resistance movements over the next five, ten years. Some who were imprisoned in classic prison style will encounter others who serve as conduits for more subversive activities, if we want to frame it that way. Particularly those who are sent to prisons where Vietnamese political prisoners are being held, many of whom are members of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. And the early flames of a combined resistance against colonial rule begin burning. Tan, however, having hid in the police headquarters during the protest, and generally claiming he had nothing to do with it, well, he is in a good position to escape, and with the help of the Japanese, he secretly makes his way to Thai-controlled Batambang, and from there to Bangkok. But he doesn't give up on the course. No siree, Bob. Tan starts writing these letters to Japanese officials, in Cambodia and elsewhere, including ministers in the Japanese government. And from what you read in them, you get this overwhelming sense that the guy was really devoted, and had a pretty clear idea about how he wanted things to be, but that maybe these plans were just a bit naive. For instance, the Japanese hadn't really done anything to overtly help the Cambodian nationalists at this point. The impression is that they had kind of fostered their movement to an extent, encouraged it, but perhaps just to keep the French off balance, rather than out of a real sense of pan-Asian pride. I'm not sure if the phrase, using them, is completely appropriate, but given Imperial Japan's behaviour in the years leading up to and including the Second World War, I don't think it's that far off the mark. And Tan, devoted as he is to his cause, he does come off sounding just a little needy in these letters, like someone desperate to find love, and they meet someone, but they ignore some of the signs that that person might not be as interested as they are in a fully engaged relationship. He writes to Japanese officials as if they were as committed as he is. In his letters, he advocates for, quote, Reorganization of Cambodia in accordance with the new order instituted by the Empire of the Rising Sun. Or asking, Should I go to Tokyo or remain in Bangkok to recommence activity until Cambodia is independent and the Imperial Army effectively occupies the Khmer Kingdom. Later, another letter. All of us, monks and the lay people, we are quite attached to Japan in the cause of Cambodia's independence, knowing that we can form with the other states of Yellow Asia a compact block around Japan, the liberator and defender of the Yellow World. He also says he's writing these letters as the representative of the Khmer Nationalist Party. A party which he said included the entire population of Cambodia, all the Cambodians in the territory ceded to Thailand, 
the Khmer population in southern Vietnam, and all the Cambodians living in Bangkok. So, you know, he's pretty convinced that he's a pretty big deal. Although, as Chandler dryly notes, this Cambodian nationalist movement was probably the product of Tan's imagination. Tan's hopes, perhaps originally stemming from that encouragement to engage in this protest against the French. Like, this almost sounds like someone who's been stood up on a date. And they're sending text messages to the person who hasn't arrived yet. Oh, oh, I see you're late, but I'm sure this is all part of your brilliant plan. And that I know you're, you know, you're thinking about this date as much as I am, and it's going to be amazing. I'm going to keep waiting, don't worry. And then a few minutes later, another text. You know, oh, uh, you've probably been caught in traffic. I'm so looking forward to this, so I know you're going to be here soon. And then, you know, another 20 minutes later, this final text saying like, oh, oh, I've got it. I'm at the wrong bar. And you've been waiting for me somewhere else. Don't worry, I'm on my way. And he, you know, just leaves and runs around looking for someone. Well, these hopes that the Japanese were going to swoop in and support this Cambodian nationalist cause in any major show of force against the French, they must have faded when the sentences for those arrested in the Umbrella Revolt begin being handed out six months later. Pak Chauen and the monks that were originally arrested, Hem Chiu and Nuan Dong, are all given a death sentence. This is later lessened to a life sentence with hard labour, but all three are sent to the infamous French colonial prison off the coast of Vietnam, Puolo Condor. Tan, realising that this date just isn't going to happen, he heads to Tokyo by way of a Japanese aircraft carrier, telling his supporters that we must wait and that only after Japan's complete victory in Asia will all of the other Asian people's problems begin to be solved. Tan will not return to Cambodia until 1945. In Japan, he will assume a Burmese identity for public purposes, lodging with a Japanese businessman for three years, learning the language and receiving an allowance of about 100 yen per month. Tan's expectance of Japanese assistance, or perhaps the idea that they would enthusiastically support the Khmer in their movement, seems naive. He's failing to foresee any long-term imperialist ambitions that the Japanese were obviously showcasing, as well as overestimating what they would have been willing to do when they were nominally allied to the Vichy France regime that was maintaining control of Indochina. And it is not altogether surprising that the Japanese did not fully back Tan and his small group of nationalists either. It's not as if that he was a highly skilled politician or that the movement itself was particularly developed. And as Tan stayed in Tokyo becoming a kind of nationalist hero for many back in Cambodia. And the instigators of the Umbrella Revolt began their jail terms off the coast of Vietnam, the Nagaravata itself being shut down as a result of this, naturally. Well, an uneasy calm returned to the French protectorate in Cambodia. But one that would not last for long. 
Most histories of Cambodia, or the politics of Cambodia, will place emphasis on the demonstration that occurred in July 1942 as a kind of catalyst for nationalism in the country for years to come. It certainly stands out on the kind of simplified, big picture timeline of events, you know? There's not going to be another standout for another three years or so. The nationalists go quiet. Tan infrequently writes letters to people trying to keep that momentum going. But before we get toward the end of the Second World War, and all of the crazy stuff that's going to start happening in and around that, I think we should probably spend a few moments checking in with a couple of the characters in this story who are still growing up in these tumultuous years. Naturally, some of you may have been asking... What is the future leader of the Khmer communist movement doing now? Well, the young Salot Tsar was in Phnom Penh during the Umbrella Revolt. The last time we'd checked in, he was attending school in the capital, sneaking in some visits here and there as a youngster into the lodgings of the king's concubines. This was early days Tsar. Tsar the fairly mediocre student, friendly and amusing. His lack of aptitude for his educational activities would see him held back a couple of years. Sa would fail at his initial attempts to get into the prestigious Lycee Sisawat in Phnom Penh, which is a level of schooling kind of like the equivalent of your last two years of secondary school before going on to university. Instead, in 1943, Sao is accepted into a newly opened junior middle school in Kampong Cham, the Priya Sianuk. Philip Short claims that at this new school, as was with the Ecole Miche that he had been attending in Phnom Penh, Sao was still a mediocre student. Nothing changed there. I'll just quote him here. Whether this was because he had difficulty keeping up, or because schoolwork did not interest him, is unclear. Either way, he was not academically inclined. He could perhaps be described as a modest all-rounder. It is at this school, however, that Saar will meet another future leader of democratic Kampuchea, Kyu Sampan, who is in the class below him. Classmates remember Saar being okay at music, played the violin as well as the traditional Cambodian instrument, the Ronyat. One remembered how Sa loved playing football and had been able to perfect his bicycle kick technique. Philip Short says that though Sa was in Phnom Penh in July of 1942, it appears he did not witness the demonstration against the arrest of the monks. In any case, he says that this protest didn't have a huge impact on many of the youngsters of Sars' generation, who were still in their late teens or early twenties. He does mention one, however, another one of those who will eventually be a senior figure in revolutionary Cambodia, Young Seri, the young man recalling that when the news of the Umbrella Revolt reached the town in Prey Vang that he was living in, quote, everyone talked about it. It gave me, for the first time, an understanding of the word nation. End quote. Given that Yang Seri was only 17 when the news of this anti-French demonstration reached his town, and yet he still had this kind of reaction to it, I think that gives a sense of what many others in Cambodia must have been feeling. Again, it's hard to agree with the somewhat delusional Song Nok Tan, that there was any kind of concerted nationwide movement for independence or for Cambodian nationalism. But there is certainly something stirring. Particularly if we match this growing rise in nationalistic energy with the kinds of glorification of Cambodia's Angkor period that the French themselves had been engaging in. That small, educated elite had certainly become aware of the possibility for change. 
Buddhist figures had also become resentful of the French, especially when the Vichy regime stepped up efforts to Romanize the Cambodian language and reinforce those changes to the calendar. In fact, this apparently almost caused the young king, Sihanouk, to abdicate, but he was convinced not to by his parents and advisors. The French had reacted quite harshly to the Umbrella Revolt, but in this uneasy calm that followed, they had continued to try and bolster their somewhat tricky position in Cambodia by maximising that association with Sihanouk. They got him out on tour even more in the countryside, placing their administration right alongside a king for whom the population still held the deepest reverence. Out visiting the people of his country, Sihanouk would later claim that it was in these years that he developed an understanding of the difficulties in life that many of the rural populations faced. But this was also a time where he embarked on plenty of those amorous adventures, as he tactfully puts it. Osborne's biography of the king simply has about a page and a half just listing off women and children that come from these encounters with Sihanouk. I guess the overall point I could make about the years leading up to the end of the Second World War is that for many of the characters that will play major roles throughout the rest of this series, well, at this point, many of them are still quite young. But there will be a kind of changing of the guard from the adults who are involved in this era quite directly and those like Saar who are watching this and certainly being affected by it who are going to eventually inherit Cambodian politics. But the next event on the horizon will make a big impression on those actively involved and those still waiting in the wings. The Second World War was advancing to a series of staggered endpoints. The war in Europe raging, as well as in the Pacific. By 1944, the first Khmer resistance organisations are beginning to develop on the Thai border what we, as I said before, can begin loosely defining as Khmer Isarak. Membership is small, but we're seeing the kernels of organised resistance in the post-war period. By the end of that year, the tide of the war in the Pacific was turning in the Allies' favour, and a big part of that is going to be the widespread bombing of Japanese forces scattered throughout the region and Japan itself. In fact, in February of 1945, an incident will occur that will provide a kind of microcosm, a grim foreshadowing of events that will occur leading into the Khmer Rouge period. A United States B-29 warplane attempted to bomb the Japanese military headquarters in Phnom Penh. The bombs did not find their target. Instead, they fell in front of the Unalom Monastery, which is not far from the Royal Palace. On that riverside boulevard, many tourists will frequent on their visits today. The blast killed 20 monks and perhaps up to 600 civilians. As a result, two Samut, then known as Achar Sok, Achar is like a Khmer title given to certain monks. He was a professor of Pali at the monastery, and he was terrified enough by this event to flee into the countryside. Eventually, like some of the other monks that participated in the Umbrella Revolt, he will find his way to Vietnam and begin working with the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. In fact, he and a fellow ex-monk, Acha Mien, will, under Vietnamese tutelage, become the founders of Khmer communism. By March 1945, the situation on the ground in Indochina, indeed in Europe and the Pacific, was changing. 
Germany was losing the Second World War at a pace. The Japanese position was similar. Germany will surrender in May, while Japan will hold out until August. But as most of us are aware, it will take quite a showing of force to convince the Japanese to formally surrender. Fire and fury. And in the months leading up to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they will attempt to hold on with extreme determination. They had never formally taken Indochina away from their kind of ally in Vichy France, but as General Charles de Gaulle's control of France itself had now become apparent. Well, naturally those French officials still stationed in Indochina began reassessing their position, and the Japanese also reassessed their position on the French. The Japanese at this point are preparing for allied landings of troops all around the Pacific and Indochina. The prospect of the French still stationed there joining these forces was something that they needed to avoid. Therefore, two courses of action emerge. The Japanese begin training local militia groups in these countries to help them counter this oncoming onslaught. And we're also going to have to do something about the French, aren't we? On the 9th of March, at 9.30pm, in a bold and coordinated gesture, Japanese military forces across Indochina moved to disarm and intern any French armed units and officials. This took everyone by surprise even those local Cambodians who had been trained in these militia groups under the Japanese. One of these militiamen, Chan Dara, who was one of Song Nyok Tan's followers and living out in Stong Treng province, he gives an account of the Indochina-wide coup de force, and Ben Kiernan restates it in How Pol Pot Came to Power. Quote, At six o'clock one evening, four Japanese, including two lieutenant colonels and two youths, asked me to walk with them, and gave me a sword and a knife. I was then asked to go and eat something, but not to go to sleep, because they had something to do that night. I readied myself, according to their orders, and at ten o'clock that night we were informed that we were going to arrest the French. Over the next two hours, the Japanese encircled and arrested all the French citizens in the province. The Japanese victory over the French in Cambodia took an estimated 24 hours. End quote. So that was just out in the provinces, but in Phnom Penh, it's a similar story. Air raid sirens were turned on by the Japanese in order to draw French residents unarmed from their quarters. In the process of rounding up and disarming them, the Japanese and the Cambodian militia units participating in this coup encountered scattered resistance. Lao Tuk, a policeman in Phnom Penh, remembered seeing four or five corpses of these Khmer militiamen outside a French official's residence. An ethnographer living in the city said that she heard the rattle of machine guns, rifle shots, and explosions from grenades. The resistance was probably fairly light, considering the magnitude of what had happened. In the whole of Indochina, there were around 40,000 French civilians, with almost half of that number comprised of women and children. That's a relatively small football stadium worth of people, spread around that entire landmass. To me, that shows off this aspect of French rule really well. Just how small that contingent of French were, and yet how much power they possessed. In Cambodia, the day after the coup de force, a royal proclamation announced the Japanese action. Two days after that, Norodom Sihanouk, the 
22-year-old king now, proclaimed the French protectorate had ended. Okay, so this is that game of political musical chairs that I was talking about earlier. Right here. Although the music had changed its tone a little over the last few years, grown a little discordant, here and now, the music abruptly stopped. And a quick look across the room, you're going to see the Japanese Imperial Army have almost come out of nowhere and quietly, quickly clicked that stop button down on the stereo. The French, still in Indochina, they don't get to pick a chair. They are put in the timeout zone for a few months. And the Cambodians, not really prepared to sit down on their own chair, well, they have an arm placed on their shoulder by the Japanese, and they are directed to the seat of independence. In the course of an evening, we will see how this game of musical chairs looks in Vietnam at the end of this episode. But for Cambodia, we can get into that, because this is wild stuff. King Sihanouk's Declaration of Independence, which was in response to a formal request to do so by the Japanese, well, that invalidates Franco-Cambodian agreements. For example, they immediately null and void those attempts to Romanize the Khmer script, and they do away with the changes the French were trying to make to the Buddhist calendar. And along these lines as well, the actual name of the country is changed from the French pronunciation, Cambodge, to Kampuchea, the Khmer pronunciation of the word. The decree also pledges cooperation with the Japanese going forward. So it's independence with a catch. Kind of like how Cambodia became independent from Siam and Vietnam in the 1860s, but independent in the sense that they were now part of the French Empire. Now Cambodia was independent, but the Japanese were stationed there in force. A national cabinet is formed, and the mostly inexperienced Cambodians now feeling their way into a kind of independence they had not experienced, they begin their work. But if we just take a moment to check the time here, have a look at the calendar. So it's March 9th, the coup de force. Independence declared a couple days later. So we've got, what, one, two, three, six months until Japan will formally bow out with two cities in this empire of the rising sun being exposed to a kind of horrifying display of atomic power. So six months until Japan is gone and the French will begin moves to meekly return to claim their precious Indo-Chinese possession like nothing had changed. This will be a time for Cambodian, patriotic and nationalistic ideas to be fully supported out in the open and perhaps the time when the roots of Cambodia's communist movement will properly begin to develop. Yang Seri, who at the time of this Japanese coup had begun attending his later secondary education in Phnom Penh at that prestigious Lycée Sisawat, well, he expressed what perhaps thousands of Cambodians may have been feeling as the French protectorate collapsed. Quote, For the first time, I saw a Frenchman tied and bound. I couldn't believe my eyes. Those people were untouchable. They were so high up, they were like gods. And this man had his arms tied behind him. It was behind the palace that I watched as he was dragged off. I was horrified and fascinated. It made a very deep impression on me. End quote. David Chandler, in The Tragedy of Cambodian History, writes, quote, This action by the Japanese removed European observers from the Cambodian scene for the first time since the 1860s. Their unexpected departure probably convinced many Cambodians that something dramatic and open-ended was going on. Students in the capital 
infected with what the French later called the virus of independence, included many future Cambodian radicals. The last nine months of 1945 were a psychological boundary between two political generations. End quote. Six weeks after the Declaration of Independence, Song Nyok Tan returns to Cambodia from Japan. He is made foreign minister by Sihanouk, and eventually premier. Park Cho-un, the other editor of Nagaravata, is released from prison and returns as well. But Hem Chiu, the monk whose arrest sparked the Umbrella Revolt, had actually died during his incarceration, just one year after it began, in 1943. This martyr of Cambodian nationalism would be celebrated as such in a rally at Wat Unalom, a ceremony that would commemorate the three-year anniversary of the 1942 anti-French demonstration, as well as other symbols of what was now being included in the legacy of Cambodian nationalism. The revolt in the 1880s, the 1916 affair, the assassination of resident Bardes, and this is interesting, because the person making this speech and listing these events naturally doesn't mention that the Cambodian monarchy well, had not quite been on the side of, you know, the Cambodians on most of these occasions. Sihanouk too was aware of this, and it's clear from some of his speeches during this time that he was looking to place the monarchy back on the side of Cambodians. For instance, he claimed that French officials once they had claimed full control of Cambodia in the 1880s, had deceptively altered the chronicles of the last 20 or so years to make it seem as though the monarchy had requested the French to give them assistance. We also see clear demonstrations of ideas about what Cambodian nationalism was going to look like for many successive governments. These ideas about Cambodians needing to awaken, that the glories of the 13th century and at Angkor were the true nature of the Khmer, and problems from the outside had caused their race to be in this less than ideal position for centuries. Someone other than the Khmer themselves kept stopping Cambodia from becoming another Angkor. Despite these kinds of proclamations, both in support of the Japanese as well as in support of Cambodian nationalism, the young king will be further ostracised from what some will start considering to be the real nationalist movement over the next few months. Song Nok Tan was really the only person on this cabinet who was bringing any kind of nationalist credentials. And in August, in fact just days after the atomic devices had levelled Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a kind of weird mini-coup will occur in the royal palace. A few young members of the Cambodian militia that was being trained up by the Japanese and had been apparently dissatisfied by this new government, who they saw as just a group of old conservatives who had actually been pretty content working under the French, and now were just doing the same thing. Well, this, you know, group of youths storm into the palace demanding a genuine nationalist government and a greater role for their hero, Son Yok Tan. Now, from what I've read, historians seem to point to a lack of sources on this matter, particularly the role of the Japanese and how much they had been positioning Tan in this way. But also, who was truly behind the plot, what it hoped to achieve, whether this was Tan's plan or maybe Pak Chon, it's hard to say. But the results are fairly clear, and Sihanouk will name Song Nyok Tan Prime Minister just five days later. What's interesting here is how there is a very open and visible difference between two camps 
that are going to become increasingly relevant in Cambodian politics in the post-war era. The king is supposed to be semi-divine, right? So naturally, he should be the leader. Oh, but now we have this other cohort of people that think a greater role for people that might just be mere mortals, they think that should be an important part of the political system, rather than just some absolutist monarchical system that it had traditionally been. So I know it, lots and lots of things happen over these few years, but this is just another one of those developments. And it's also, you know, there's this smaller, more personal aspect to it. And whether or not Tan was directly behind the plot that saw him become Prime Minister, well, this is going to start a very nasty relationship between Sihanouk and the so-called founder of Cambodian nationalism in the decades that follow. Yeah, so that's, you know, August 1945. It's a lot. We've got atomic bombs, we've got new prime ministers, and when we talk about what's going to happen in Vietnam during this period, that's a whole other kettle of fish. But if we just focus on Cambodia and this new government that Tan is now presiding over, I think we can get a little bit of an insight into just how ready this government may have been when we look at the speech that he makes to his new cabinet outlining his policy objectives now that he's Prime Minister. Bearing in mind that this speech is made on the 15th of August, the same day that Emperor Hirohito announces Japan's surrender, something that will be formally signed about two weeks later. But Tan, he still makes the support of the Japanese Empire, a massive part of his policy. Chandler makes an interesting point on this, saying that perhaps the new Prime Minister did know what was going on, but was just kind of going through the motions, like he was aware that Charles de Gaulle was intending to reclaim Indochina, of Japan's impending loss, and that his new government only had months before it too would be dissolved. In late August, an Allied plane will circle over Kompong Spu, just west of Phnom Penh, dropping leaflets proclaiming the imminent return of the French. A week later, eight French officers will parachute into Cambodia, two of them brought straight to Phnom Penh. The writing is on the wall for Tan's independent Cambodia, but he tries to buy himself some legitimacy by announcing a referendum. And this is understandable. Picture this situation where now the Japanese are effectively out of this scene. The Cambodians are sitting on their own independent chair for the first time in the modern world, but they are in no position to resist the colonial power once it comes back in force. One thing you might try and do is pull that lever of popular support, write up a kind of legitimizing document that says, uh, actually, everyone here really wants to be free and independent. Oh, and they also want me to be in charge. Look, everyone signed it. See? In fact, the wording of this referendum kind of goes along those lines, asking the people if they wanted to be as free as they were under Jayavarman with the temples of Angkor Wat. This nationwide survey, which apparently got more than 500,000 results in support of Tan's government, well, it's basically a farce. It was circulated around a few government departments and made to look, you know, really balanced and transparent by including the report that two of the ballots were found to have been made invalid. So, you know, pretty even, even handling there. Maybe this was an attempt to scare the French off. We will see the kind of resistance that the French return is going to face in Vietnam. But in Cambodia, even members of Tan's cabinet were worried about the potential prospect of some kind of concerted national resistance to the French. One of these ministers, Kim Tit, actively seeks the French presence to come back and quell what he saw as a kind of crisis scenario, with the attempted coup against the royal family 
and Tan's government potentially trying to now ally itself with the Vietnamese anti-colonial resistance. By September, British forces had arrived in Saigon and begun disarming the Japanese and freeing the French prisoners of war. A British general by the name of Gracie was overseeing this operation, which soon became quite fraught as his forces and the newly freed French came into conflict with the Viet Minh. The situation was exacerbated when supplies from Cambodia, like rice, became essential to the Allied operations in Vietnam. The need became apparent to secure Indochina, with Cambodia being an important step. General Gracie was soon joined by Supreme Allied Commander Murray, who, along with a French military commander named Leclerc, decided it would be prudent to remove the potential difficulties in dealing with Tan's regime and simply remove him from the scene. In what amounts to a kind of sad little story, Commander Murray later recalled that once he arrived in Phnom Penh on October 15th, he requested Prime Minister Tan to come to his office, ostensibly to meet with this new French general, the clerk. And he came, he sat, he made small talk, and I guess you have to imagine him, you know, feeling accepted, feeling like a dignitary, speaking with at least a partially equal representative. And then after waiting about an hour, this French general comes in with a bodyguard. And now I'll quote Murray. Poor little Prime Minister thought Leclerc was welcoming him. And he got up to say, how lovely. But then he was taken by the scruff of his neck, by the bodyguard, bundled into a car, and they were off. Never saw him again. End quote. Tan, who that morning had presided over a ceremony at the Lassie Sisawat as Prime Minister, well, by lunchtime, found himself in a prison in Saigon. But it is not the end of Tan's story. He will be around for decades to come. But with that, the Allies and the French have effectively snuffed out the Cambodian independence experiment that had been going on since March. Sihanouk, who at the time of Tan's arrest had conveniently, or perhaps by design, been on a royal pilgrimage to a Buddhist Wat outside of Phnom Penh for a few days. But he'll come back and a week or so later, officially welcome the French back to Cambodia, with a statement prepared for him by the French resident superior. Sihanouk's uncle, Prince Moniret, becomes prime minister. But the political moves over the next couple of months are all designed to transition the French back into control. Discussions between the Cambodians and the French culminate in a document known as the Modus Vivendi, which will be signed in January 1946. The text acknowledges the king's autonomy in matters of internal administration and stressed the need for continuing conversations between Cambodians and the French, but also provides the returning colonial power control over basically all aspects of governance. It's not a particularly generous document to the Cambodians. But as we will soon find out over the next few episodes, French power in Indochina had effectively come to a kind of end in March 1945. So it's a wild few months. And before we try and wrap up what, again, like I said earlier, the first time you go through this period, there is so much going on here and there and so many names that come up and then come back later. I just want to circle back a little bit. I realize this episode is going to be our longest one yet. So I want to lay down again a little bit of what's happened here, as it's certainly going to inform what will happen next. So let's do kind of like a stock take here. So before World War II started, there had been no plans or procedures put in place by the French administrators of Indochina, particularly in Cambodia, to provide a plan for the people who they had colonised to be able to maintain their own countries or interests. Cambodia was a possession, a jewel in the crown, and Indochina as a whole was also a particularly valuable jewel. Despite being, well, kind of rendered a vassal state by Nazi Germany, 
and then, you know, made to appear completely inferior to the Japanese in the region, the French manage to claw back their possession. But the effect this had on the people there, particularly the kind of younger generation of students who bear witness to these events, as we said before, they will have been infected by the virus of independence. Well, that's how the French will end up putting it. We see how the political energy of nationalism finds a new audience in Cambodia, but that the timing of these events will also bring so many Cambodians into contact with their neighbours in Vietnam. The events of the Second World War will broaden the scope of Cambodian and Vietnamese relations, leading to many actively joining a kind of joint effort to remove the French presence from Indochina. And as we've seen, the most credible and advanced effort to effect this change is the Indochinese Communist Party. They're the frontrunner. In this game of musical chairs, they've claimed a chair, and they're sat in it, and it's going to be very hard to get them to get up. This will be a massive theme going forward. This split between those Khmer who see the future of Cambodia inexorably linked with Vietnam, or those that believe the Khmer and their ancestry and their glorious achievements of the past mean that there must be an independence from Vietnam in any effort to make Cambodia great again. And perhaps this mixing of energies between communism, nationalism, patriotism, well, this is going to have extreme consequences. At this point in our story, Cambodian nationalism has fully emerged. Major characters like Sihanouk, Songnok Tan, as well as the younger cohort of Khmer students that will eventually lead Democratic Kampuchea, well, they are all about to start actively participating. Khmer communism, as it is in its early stages under the complete tutelage of the Vietnamese, is now ready to grow. And the historical hurricane will begin forming very quickly. Cambodians will start playing a bigger role in that coming storm, but the cold, dry foreign winds will not cease either. French attempts to re-colonise Indochina will not end well. And the role that the Cold War, which could be said to also officially begin at the end of the Second World War, will now start to directly influence proceedings. We started this episode in the status quo, and end it with what the French would have hoped would become the status quo once again. But it will not work out like that. The cat is out of the bag. And while Indochina may have escaped much of the horror that was on display in the Second World War, it will soon become the stage for much of the world's misery. Now, at the end of this episode, I'm going to have a kind of epilogue. Back in Vietnam, as Ho Chi Minh, as he is now calling himself, will declare an independent Vietnam. It's going to be maybe a recurring segment on the podcast, and because this series is primarily aimed at explaining the Khmer Rouge and Cambodian history, while also having to spend a necessary amount of time on topics that do fall outside of that direct focus, but are nonetheless essential in understanding the Khmer Rouge Revolution, I'm going to start using that space to talk about these extended topics. And one of these massive topics that is naturally right on the doorstep now is the First and Second Indochinese Wars, the struggle against French colonialism, and then the US war with Vietnam. This is not a series that really is focusing on military history, so we're not going to approach these conflicts with particular zeal or fascination, but the human impact and the political impact and the effect these wars have on the historical hurricane is very important. So naturally, we are going to have to deal with them extensively. But most histories 
that you'll see of the Vietnam War will naturally focus on that, and Cambodia will be very much a sideshow, to use a phrase that is now associated with the war in Cambodia. But maybe I'll try and flip that, and Cambodia will be our focus, with the Vietnam War and the, and the First Indochina War as well, kind of being the side focus, while we primarily look at, say, the life of Salazar, or Cambodian politics and how that leads into trouble with the growing conflict in Vietnam. So with all of that in mind, I'd like to spend the epilogue of this episode, our first epilogue, and try and dig slightly into the rise to power of the Indochinese Communist Party in Vietnam, and how this transforms into the Viet Minh, and the genesis of the First Indochina War. We've just looked at how those five years during the Second World War looked in Cambodia, and how these tumultuous events led to big changes. Well, the same goes for Vietnam, but uh, in a different way. I'm going to start the story from the time that the Japanese staged the Indo-Chinese-wide coup de force against the French on the 9th of March, 1945. Now, what this also gives you an opportunity to do, if you are already familiar with the Vietnam War and the Vietnamese side of this equation, then feel free to skip this section. But for those that aren't, or for those that want to see how particular aspects of the Vietnamese story will directly influence the Cambodian one, feel free to listen to this next section just to get that wider perspective on this complex history. Nineteen forty five was a kind of dividing line in world history and in the history of Indochina. And we could say, using the same kind of analogy that we have been building toward for Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge, that 1945 was the year that a historical hurricane was fully unleashed in Vietnam. There will be a revolution. A revolution that will see a colonised people liberate themselves. As we saw in Cambodia, the Japanese coup in March will produce conditions that both the French and perhaps the native Vietnamese had not thought possible. And for Nguyen Ai Quoc, now known as Ho Chi Minh, a possibility for his movement to thrive in. That being said, these were quite awful conditions, really. But as we've seen in revolutionary France and Russia so far in this series, it is often when a whole people are seemingly pushed to a precipice that they can unite against their repression. By December 1944, Vietnam was in the midst of a terrible famine. Hunger is a terrible way to die particularly if the conditions that have produced that widespread misery are not merely acts of God, drought, flooding, natural disaster, but are also the acts of men. One of the reasons that Japan had occupied Indochina was to secure supplies for its armies in southern China. The Japanese, as we saw, early on they weren't challenging French rule, but they were requisitioning large amounts of Indochinese rice, and forced many Vietnamese peasants to convert their rice fields into industrial or cash crops, like jute or cotton. These farmers did not reap much reward for this kind of change either, often left with barely enough materials to say, clothe their young children. But as rice production either diminished or the produce was taken away from the people who grew it, well, soon enough, famine took its terrible 
grip. Once the Japanese coup had occurred, the French officials, mostly imprisoned, conditions in the countryside became increasingly worse, as there was little consideration by the Japanese to take care of these kinds of functions of governance. It was almost like no one was in charge. More than one million Vietnamese will die in this famine. One political group which tried to alleviate this suffering was the Vietnamese Independence League, or Viet Minh. Formed in 1941 following a decade of severe repression of both nationalist and communist movements in Vietnam by the French, this new movement, which was set up following an Indo-Chinese Communist Party meeting, and I'm going to keep just calling them ICP from this point in, well, the Viet Minh were a new front in the fight for national liberation, and it was aimed against all types of aggressors. So not just the French, but also the Japanese. In the years leading up to the Second World War, before the colonial authorities had completely banned communist activities out in the open, the ICP had begun enmeshing itself within the peasant class of Vietnam. Even studying the socio-economic relations of these predominantly rural peoples. Remember how Friedrich Engels had written about the conditions of the working class in England? We could think about this kind of study by the Vietnamese communist scholars in a similar way. A leading member of the ICP, Vo Nguyen Gia, co-wrote a detailed look of the peasant class, studying the peasant question, as they put it. In a report, they concluded that, quote, Their misfortunes are so numerous that the peasant cannot catch his breath. But still people think that the peasant is secure and well-off. Aristocratic and bourgeois writers set out in their cars and speed through the countryside. They see the green and fragrant fields, the thick smoke rising from the thatched roofs in the evening, and immediately invent a picture full of poetic flavour. But they don't know. They don't know that at times the peasants can eat only one meal every two days, and that they must work at night by the light of the moon or in the dark. The children have bloated bellies, and their skin is as pale as wilted leaves. End quote. The report was finished in 1937, and in it, the author's draw lessons from their study that relate to this peasant class being a mostly oppressed and exploited majority, and that therefore this class has a hidden force worthy of attention and respect. The idea is that the ICP must learn how to use this class in any attempt at revolution. And as repression of the communists had meant that their operations were spread to areas less susceptible to interference by, say, colonial police, or later, the attention of the Japanese Imperial Army, a symbiotic relationship began to form between the needs of this class, as well as the needs of the communist movement in Vietnam. By the latter stages of the Second World War, the Viet Minh had become the only political party operating in all three parts of French Vietnam, and had bested all of the other serious contenders to lead a kind of national liberation movement. Due to their own clever politics, the state that these other movements were left in after the brutal repression by the French, as well as the kinds of Leninist operations that are conducive to a movement staying hidden and secretive, the kind of party organisation that we touched upon in our discussion of the Soviet Revolution. Eventually, one of the authors of the study of the peasant question, Jia, well, he will become leader of the military arm of the Viet Minh, who were at the end of 1944 an almost minuscule fighting force. Kiernan says here that they had 34 trained fighters, with 17 rifles to share. Small beginnings. 
But apart from fighting against the Japanese and the French, they also sought to alleviate the famine that was producing such misery in Vietnam, and largely being ignored by everyone else. The Viet Minh mobilised peasants to destroy granaries and take back the food that they themselves had grown. The ICP at the same time urging Vietnamese farmers not to turn over a single grain of rice to the Japanese. Following the Japanese coup in March, the Viet Minh immediately stepped up their attacks on the Japanese, declaring them to be the principal, concrete, immediate, and unique enemy. Quite a different stance to what we had seen the leading nationalist hero of Cambodia concluding. So we have a scenario here where the Viet Minh are able to attract massive amounts of support throughout Vietnam in a period where the Japanese are generally more concerned with their bigger ambitions to do with the Second World War. Ambitions which meant that allied forces, such as the Chinese and the United States, well, they would be looking for support in combating these. This placed the Viet Minh, despite its communist core, as a valuable asset in the wider conflict. In November 1944, Viet Minh fighters actually rescued a US pilot who had crashed near the Chinese border. Ho Chi Minh personally escorted this Lieutenant Rudolph Shaw back to a US army base in China. There he met American officials and OSS personnel. Uh, that, that's the precursor to the CIA. Ho Chi Minh would return in May 1945 with a team of 40 OSS advisors and military instructors, dispatched to help potential US airmen who might crash in the future, but also with stepping up their attacks on the Japanese. By July 1945, the Viet Minh was exploding as a political force, with membership somewhere around 150,000 in Tonkin, 20,000 in Annam, and 10,000 in Cochin, China. Which actually nicely shows the kind of distribution their power had throughout each part of the country. Much more stable and powerful in the north, less so in the south where the political situation was a bit more complex, with a few other groups, including religious nationalist movements, also maintaining a bit more power. Which is a point we should plant a bit of a flag in, because as you are probably aware, we are going to eventually see Vietnam split up between North and South, and parts of that process, well, it's actually super complex if you go into the deeper history of it all, but parts of that north-south dynamic will come about as a result of the power distribution of the Viet Minh. But we'll come back to that in the next episode. Anyway, by July, as we've seen, the Japanese are still controlling Indochina. The French still imprisoned in the prisons they'd built. But the Viet Minh if we use that musical chairs idea again, well, they are waiting for the music to stop. And they've got like four or five chairs that they are ready to pounce on if the timing is right. By the time Hirohito announces the Japanese surrender, well, the Viet Minh moved fast and took the initiative to essentially pick up control once the Japanese had given it up. Its local committees patiently set up over the previous few years, and I'll quote Keenan here, rode to power on a tide of revolution that swept the country from north to south, as yet with little widespread violence. This was possible because the French and then the Japanese had each in turn suffered defeat, while Ho had managed to secure the backing of the victorious Americans. But the communists and their Viet Minh movement would never have been able to fill the power vacuum if the population had not seen them as the leading champions of Vietnamese independence against both the French and Japanese. 
and no other Vietnamese group was seriously attempting to tackle the famine. End quote. On the 19th of August, they take power in Hanoi, as the Japanese troops stand by and watch. On the 24th, they do the same in Saigon. However, in the south, Viet Minh's strength was used against any potential political rivals to their taking control. Formerly, the whole country was under Viet Minh rule, and on the 30th of August, Bao Dai, the emperor who, like Sihanouk, had announced Vietnamese independence but under Japanese rule, well now he abdicated, and the Viet Minh were in control. Now before we get to what I think is this kind of beautiful culmination to a momentous month in Southeast Asian history, we could perhaps just slightly foreshadow some of the behaviour that sometimes goes under the radar in this Vietnamese revolution. We are naturally kind of rooting for the Viet Minh here. We're appalled at the kind of exploitation and oppression that these people have been subject to. But it is still a political movement, and a predominantly Leninist one at the core, which perhaps explains some of the echoes we might identify in the targeting of enemies of the revolution in its wake. On the 19th of August, the same day they took power in Hanoi, the Indochinese Communist Party set up the Vietnamese People's Police, who quickly begin targeting Vietnamese collaborators, or those they thought were opposed to the foundation of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam that was soon to be proclaimed in a very famous speech by Ho Chi Minh. There were killings of rival political groups too, and targeted assassinations of royalists, among others. But this is a discussion we will pick up again in later episodes. For now, let's return to Hanoi on the 2nd of September, as the now victorious revolutionary and new president of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, announces this new order in front of nearly half a million people. I'm going to quote the first couple of sections, and then briefly a few others throughout, to give you a feeling for it, because it is an important speech in world history. So, he begins. <laughs> My countrymen, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the nations on the earth are equal from birth. All the nations have the right to live, to be happy and free. The Declaration of the French Revolution, made in 1791, on the rights of man and the citizen, also states, All men are born free and with equal rights, and must always remain free and having equal rights. Those are undeniable truths. Nevertheless, for more than 80 years, the French colonists misused the flag of liberty, equality, and fraternity to invade our fatherland and oppressed our countrymen. Their action was contrary to humanity and justice. Now, I'm going to skip a little ahead in the speech here. They have built more prisons than schools. They have mercilessly slain our patriots. They have drowned our resistance in rivers of blood. They used opium and alcohol to weaken our race. Economically, they have exploited our people to the bone, so as to impoverish our people and devastate our country. On March 9, the Japanese disarmed the French army. The French colonialists either fled or surrendered. 
as a matter of fact, they were not only incapable of protecting us, but had also sold out our country twice to the Japanese. After the Japanese surrendered to the Allies, our people rose to regain our national sovereignty and to found the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The truth is that we have wrested our independence from the Japanese and not from the French. The French have fled. The Japanese have capitulated. Emperor Bao Dai has abdicated. Our people have broken the chains which for nearly a century have confined them and have won independence for our fatherland. The whole Vietnamese people, animated by a common purpose, are determined to fight to the bitter end against any attempt by the French colonialists to reconquer their country. We are convinced that the Allied nations have acknowledged the principles of self-determination and equality of nations. They will not refuse to acknowledge the independence of Vietnam. Now, that did sort of, like I said, that did skip through certain sections. So I do actually recommend, if you want to look it up, it is freely available online. It's a great speech. One of those historically important ones, because it captures so much about that moment in history for so many of the people of the world. It also exposes so much of the hypocrisy inherent in colonial systems, and it's a speech to the new allied victors of World War II. It's saying, hey, look at me, look at us. We are going to have our country, and you should acknowledge that. A lecture I watched while researching this episode pointed out even the powerful symbolism of a moment that happens kind of outside of the lines of the speech. This is a moment where Ho Chi Minh, he begins speaking, and he he wonders if the microphone he's using is actually working. And he calls out to the massive crowd. He says, compatriots, can you hear me? To which they reply to him in a massive chorus. I mean, can you imagine upwards of 400,000 people all at once saying, yes. And this seemingly innocuous back and forth, well, it highlights how different this relationship was. The French certainly didn't address the Vietnamese as equals, inquiring if they could be helped. Nor so, in fact, would the royal institutions, which had been in control in Vietnam for centuries before the French colonised their land, There's no way a ruler of their nation would have addressed them in this fashion either. But, as we'll see, and as Ho kind of alludes to in his speech, this story isn't going to have a happy ending. As we saw in Cambodia, the French are coming back. Independence was not something that these people could take for themselves. No, for the French, in their minds... Independence would only be able to be granted to these people, who in their minds were playing government. And the kind of nationalist and indeed communist energy that had been unleashed in Indochina over the course of the Second World War, well, that was not something that would be easily contained by the returning French, nor by the New World Order ushered in as the Cold War began dividing the planet. The hurricane in Vietnam, and soon in Cambodia, would begin its devastating journey. Thanks again for listening to another episode here. Um, At the end, if you are still listening, I do just want to actually thank uh, 
all of the Patreon supporters of the show now. Uh, Brian, Cassie, Chris, Eli, Molly, Rob, Sam, and Tina. Thank you so much for your support. I also want to thank the PayPal supporters who have contributed so far. So, Bunra, Will, and Samiran, as well as Lakhena. Thank you so much. Until next time, guys. Thanks again. <laughs>